I'm with Professor Charles Hoags. Uh, Charles, um, we've just heard your plenary lecture this morning on what, ma uh, what matters when preventing post-operative cognitive decline. Um, great presentation. Um, if you had to give us some take-home messages for factors under the anaesthetist control, what, what would you say? Yeah, so it's, uh, I think when we look at cognitive disorders after uh, anesthesia and surgery, you know, we, we, we know a lot more about delirium, I think, than we do about cognitive dysfunction, what we classically would call PLCD. I think with delirium <coughs> and these together, I think that this is still a work in progress. I think that, that, that some of the things we, we, we could do is, also, is to first consider making sure the patients are fit for surgery. That, that they're you know, nutritionally sound, that, that they're, they're not debilitated and they're in the best shape possible. I'm actually an advocate that we should be very careful that, that their depression is under control because many patients are depressed and not, we don't know about it. I think interoperatively, I think there's, there's things um, that people are talking about that are not really 100% proven yet, like you know, does anesthetic depth, does general versus regional for some procedures. Uh, I think uh, that, that all these things are still, we're still learning and getting more evidence as we go. Um, go along, I think there are some data that would suggest that maybe keeping the patients less deep uh, during surgery might influence the frequency of, of delirium, at least. So I think this is a work in progress. The other thing that uh, postoperatively, there are programs that have been adopted around the world where there's a multidisciplinary approach to taking care of the patients postoperatively, particularly the, the elderly to make sure that certain things happen, like they're oriented, that they have a clock in the room, that they have a window in the room, that they, they have their glasses and their hearing aids, that their fluid and electrolytes pain is controlled, do the best we can to promote sleep hygiene. And all these things can contribute in reviewing their drug list to make sure that it's not polypharmacy that could have um, drugs with CNS unintended side effects with anticholinergic properties. So I think there are comprehensive programs. Um, some of our own research would suggest that we could probably manage blood pressure more precisely, but we, we haven't really um, come into a definitive um, conclusion yet, but our data to, to, to date would suggest that we can individualize blood pressure targets based on cerebral autoregulation endpoints may be another approach that we can do to optimize brain perfusion during surgery. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, you discussed in your talk um, the role of biomarkers in um, postoperative delirium and cognitive dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a role outside of the research setting for these biomarkers in potentially uh, performing them preoperatively or postoperatively to uh, identify the patients most at risk? Not at the moment. Um, this is still research. This is work in progress. Uh, but I think we're heading in that direction. I mean, we've had some positive results with a brain-specific brain, brain injury biomarker called um, GFAT, glial fibrillatory acid protein, which is produced by the, the um, astrocytes that it's elevated, when it's elevated, it's related to cognitive performance after surgery. Uh, we're working with other biomarkers, including brain-derived neurotrophic factors. We have some other data which we haven't analyzed yet, looking at other neuron-specific biomarkers. Uh, the group from Melbourne actually has published an interesting paper recently um, in JAMA Neurology, looking at a neurofilament protein that's associated with, uh, with injury and Alzheimer's disease. So I think that we're gonna see more and more work along this lines that maybe we could have a more precise diagnosis earlier and maybe have a, a, a way to strategize how we can improve their cognitive outcomes. But it's still in a research setting at the moment. Sure, sure. If we were to identify a patient uh, at risk, be that from a biomarker or a neurocognitive test, are there modifiable factors preoperatively that we can um, influence to decrease the chance of delayed neurological recovery? I think at the moment the, the best the best we could do is a multi, the multimodal effect of trying to limit the polypharmacy to um, have a multidisciplinary geriatric oriented program that's that's sort of just a guidelines for how to take care of these patients as a as a matter of policy and to be very aggressive with that at the moment I don't think there's any convincing evidence that any type of one drug versus the other would make a difference, but um, I think that this is a very active area of research that is going to continue to evolve and hopefully we can get some better tools in the near future. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there is a feeling by some people in the literature and people like Michael Avedan have written about this, um, that persistent postoperative cognitive um, dysfunction is actually a myth and that people just take a hit initially and then rejoin their natural declining uh, cognitive dysfunction. What, what would be your feelings on yeah, that? Yeah, you know, um, so that, the, some of the first work on that was done by my former colleagues at Johns Hopkins, Ola Sells and Guy McCann, and they did a really beautiful paper that they published in 2006 in the Archives of Neurology. Um, and what they did is they looked at cognitive performance in patients having cabbage surgery, and they had a control group. 
In the control group were patients with coronary calf proven coronary disease, but they were being treated medically. So both groups had cognitive t testing at specified time periods before, before you know, surgery or point zero for the non-surgical controls. Then uh, at three months, six months, and they followed them out for six years. And what they found is the cognitive trajectories for the cardiac surgery group was really no different on average than the, the control group with sort of the disease-specific control group. So those data would suggest that your rate of cognitive decline over time, out to six years, is really more a factor of your cerebrovascular disease progression than, than surgery and anesthesia. Now that said, there are subgroups of patients who may fall off that curse. When you're looking at average data, you know, there may be people that are hidden, because some people may get better, some people may do worse, but the average stays the same. Uh, we, we have this tendency to think that patients who have post-operative delirium may be a group that fall off their natural cognitive trajectory. Um, our work would suggest that, that they may fall off, but they may get back, recover by a year. So um, there may be some acute differences. So I, by and large, I think that we don't have the answer to all the questions yet. Yeah, sure. And the other thing that I talk about is that there's a pervasive bias in all these studies is that the people who enroll in these studies may not be representative of the larger patient populations. Um, patients who consent for research investigations are often a little better educated. Uh, um, they often are not uh, minority um, individuals. Um, they may not, even, you know, they probably speak English in America. You know, there's, you can do the studies in other countries, but so I, I don't know if we have the full breadth of, of, of knowledge of the full breadth of cognitive disorders after surgery yet. But, yeah. uh, so I still, th I, th I think it's an evolving, evolving science. Mm. You presented some um, somewhat scary data that there's really quite a broad range um, between patients in terms of the, the lower limit of the cerebral autoregulatory threshold mm -hmm. um, between about 40 and 90 millimeters of mercury. Um, in the absence of a, a reliable monitor to de detect um, that range for, for an individual patient mm -hmm. at the moment, what would you advise we do with regards to intraoperative blood pressure well, management? Well, I think the best answer is to monitor it, uh, but that's still a research tool and not everybody can do it. I think eventually these monitors will be made available, uh, or if you're sort of an engineering savvy, you could do it yourself, but it takes, it takes an effort and, and persistence. And, uh, so I think that that's going to evolve over time. So at the moment, our data would suggest, on bypass at least, that the best place probably to keep the blood pressure is in the range of 70 to 75, probably 75. And you'll, get, but scary, you know, quite quite disturbingly, is that you're still going to get it wrong about 15 to 20 percent of the time. Mm -hmm. That it's either going to be too high or low for that individual patient. But I think our data, and we've monitored over 800 patients now, it's pretty consistent that that's probably the target mm, sure. that I would recommend because that's probably above most patients' lower limit and it's below most patients' upper limit. Yeah, sounds very safe. Yeah. yeah. Charles, thanks very much for your yeah, time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Cheers.